And, um, but I'm super excited. So why don't you put your hands together for Pastor Jacob as he comes and shares the word. Something about a boat. I think that's a better title than what I have. Something about a boat. All right. So for those that know me, particularly our words people, know that I'm not generally overly structured with the way I put my messages together where... I definitely sort of sit in there's a prophet teacher sort of role and the scripture says the prophet comes before the teacher so I say there's my uh, scriptural doctrinal correct reason disclaimer for why my stuff's all over the place but today I'm going to try and be really quite succinct I have points I have uh, and we're going to try and work from points and I'm excited and this might be why Mel's so excited she's like no. So the, uh, the, uh, the message this morning is called, Jesus is in your boat. Jesus is in your boat. And what I want to do is I actually want to have a bit of fun with, um, with, like there's a lot of stories in the Bible where Jesus rides in a boat. And I was like, just thinking, as I was last week, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, you know what, I want to actually pull apart a little bit of, of Jesus in the boat and what we, can we learn from it. So I've got three lessons that we can learn from the boat. From Jesus in the boat. The first lesson that I would like us to have a look at is that he is God over the boat and the storm. He's God over the boat and the storm. So we've got two passages we're going to quickly look at and then we'll uh, screw down a little bit. Uh, Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 4 verse 35 says this. That day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let us go uh, over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as, uh, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Uh, so here, like, I think us as believers have no problem giving God sovereignty over our storms. If you're anything like me, hard times are when you're closest to God. I, I sometimes think if I was God, I'd give me more hard times because it's the time where I actually would make sure I'm pulling into him. It's a time where I'd be like, you know, sometimes when things are going amazingly, I find myself doing, you know, like uh, less urgency in my, my prayer life, less uh, dedication, less structure. Less, but when things are hard, I'm like straight back to the source. I'm like, God, you are Lord over this storm. You are Lord over the storm. And, and, and that's cool. And, and I think most people actually have no issue with that. This story is one that the disciples get a real hard time for. Like they're in a boat. Jesus said, we're going to the other side. They're riding along in this boat. It's looking really stormy and dangerous. And then Jesus is just fast asleep in this boat, head on a pillow. I don't know why that's, uh, that's a detail they put in there, like head on a pillow. I was like, okay, I'm finding it interesting you've got pillows on your boat, but that's a separate thing. And, but he's fast asleep. And we give the disciples a hard time in this story because Jesus, will actually, when he wakes up, he gives them a hard time. And I don't think any of us would have thought anything bad about these guys waking Jesus up. Like, like so like, let's just, okay, you're having a hard time. You're, let's just imagine you're in something, let's just out of nowhere, just a boat. Let's say you're in a boat, you go into Rottnest. And then the storm kicks up. And it's looking really bad, looking super scary. Waves kicking over, engines sputtering. It's all looking really bad. And you go, oh, God, help me, help me, help me. That's my response. I'm like, I'm like, God, help. <laughs> and then, no worries. Cool, cool, cool. Except this is all that's happened here. Except then Jesus wakes up and he's like, goes, he pays out and his disciples. He's like, oh, you have little faith. Where was your faith? You little... You know, and, and he just and and we're all like, yeah, you little weaklings, you little faith disciples, and all. It's like you, you would you would do it too. I would do it too. I know, like, uh, so I don't actually properly understand why Jesus rebukes, and that's something that I'm on my. I, you know, I believe it's rebukable because he's like perfect and everything, but I I don't understand that yet. I'll get there, and if I don't suss it out when I get there, I'll ask him. And uh, but. You know, so there's no problem. We, we put Jesus as Lord of our storm. Easy. Now, 
this is what I want us to remember is that he's also Lord of our boat. He's God over the boat and the storm. And Luke chapter 5, it says this, uh, verse, starting from verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of uh, Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down uh, your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Saying here, so in the storm, there's a response and I'm talking, you don't have to be, you don't have to be, I, I reckon people that aren't even what we would describe as people of faith, if you're in a life-threatening storm, you pray. They say you can never take school, uh, prayer out of schools as long as you have exams. You, uh, and I heard, like, oh, we've never been to war, but I heard there were no atheists in the foxholes. And there were no atheists in the trenches. It, it, it's, this is a thing, it's in it, it comes out. But here, Jesus is saying to this guy, hey, I want your boat. And he's like, oh, okay. And then he's like, I want you to do something with your boat. And he's like, well. <laughs> uh, but then he, and then eventually, like, he actually has to reconcile at first. And then he says, because you say, he's like, basically he says no. He's like, well, I don't want to. But because you say, because you're saying I will, but what he's saying is I don't want to. You know those things where it's like, I don't want to, but I will. When Jesus is saying, hey, I want your boat, and then he's saying, hey, I want you to do this with your boat, the guy says to him, I don't want to, but I will. And what I like about this is most of the time God wants my boat. Most of the time God wants one of my good things. Most of the time he wants something that is an asset not a liability. We're happy to give him our liabilities. We love giving him our storms. But when he says, I want the asset, it's like he can have my mortgage, man. <laughs> Jesus, take it. The house, well, not so much. And, and, and what he wants to teach us here is that he is God both over the storm and the boat. Because when he says to Peter, give me your boat, now, do something with your boat. And Peter says, no, well, because it's you, I guess I should. But he does it. It's obedience. It's obedience. And I love that because sometimes we, we think like, uh, we have to be, if we're not doing it with a wonderful attitude, then what's the point? You know, a lot of us might have been raised even with, if you're not going to do it properly, don't do it. And well, no, I don't care. You, you, like, if you've got kids, you know, that actually doesn't how it works. It's like, no, clean your room. I don't care if you do it happy, sad, kicking, screaming, do it. <laughs> and then once they've done it, good kid, pat on the head. <laughs> you know, and, but this is Jesus with the boat here. And Simon saying, Peter, Simon Peter saying, nah, yeah, nah. And, and, but, but this is the cool thing. He says, all right, I don't want to, but I will. And then he does this. He says, put out in the deep and let down your nets for a, few, uh, for a catch. Simon answered, I don't want to, but I will. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What happened here? is Jesus says, Peter, I want your boat. Peter, I want to use your boat. And Peter's like, no, I don't want to, but because you say I will. But then the blessing comes, and then Peter's like, hey, I want to give you another boat. Once Peter caught on that it's good to have Jesus as not just God of your storm, but of your boat, he's like, have all my boats. And I think for us, and this is one of the things that, if we're able to start to walk and cooperate with God, he builds momentum in our lives. To where when he asks for the assets, 
then it becomes reflex for us to say yes. Peter didn't have to think about giving Jesus a second boat here. That was a response. He said, oh, Jesus, have more boats. When we start to get this momentum with God, then, then when he's asking whether he wants to be God of our storm or be God of our boats, we're okay and rushing more to him. So I think this is where a lot of us start to fall over is when we have need, we withhold. And when we have need, Jesus is saying, give me your boat. We're saying, no, Jesus, I don't want to give you my boat. I want to give you my need. And Jesus is saying, yes, give me your boat. And then what we start to, what I think we need to understand as a reflex to need is so. A reflex to need, we need to give. We need to give as a reflex to need. When we are down, when we are struggling, it is not time to withdraw. It is not time to withhold. It is time to give. And what will start to happen as we give and Jesus responds with faithfulness, he will develop this history of faithfulness with us and momentum with us. And what will start to happen is our reflex to need is give. And Jesus will truly, at that point, he is truly Lord of both your storm and your boat. He's truly Lord of both your liabilities and your assets. Lesson one of the boat. He is God over the boat and the storm. Lesson two, he is always in your boat. Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. I'm pretty sure I Bethsaida that wrong. <laughs> While he, you saw what I did there? <laughs> oh, my dad game is strong. After leave, uh, uh, and he, well, he, he made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he left, he, he went on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, as you and I would have been. Hang on, Jacob, didn't you say the lesson here is he is always in the boat? This is a clear story of where he wasn't in the boat and then he got into the boat. Is your, is your theory faulty? Is the lesson faulty? Is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, what I want us to see here is that Jesus physically was not in the boat. It actually says that he, was, he saw them. He was watching them. And I believe it was a supernatural seeing because he's up some sort of a mountain. They're in the middle of a, 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 a large lake in the middle of a storm. I don't think physical seeing would have been possible from that sort of proximity. So I, from what I, you know, I'm totally speculating, but I expect that Jesus saw them because he's, all, like, he's God and he, he knew prophetically what was going on. And he saw them. So he's not even close enough to be seeing with his eyes because he's up a mountain there in the middle of a lake. And then the storm's coming. He says, guys, I want you to go over here. I'll catch up. And then he goes and catches up. So what I want you to see is that even though he wasn't in the boat, he was in the boat because he gave his word. He said, guys, go to this place. And what we have to appreciate is that there are going to be times with God where he will say, do a thing, go to a place. And then it feels like he is not with you. There is no feelings. You know the feelings? The, uh, you know, like, you know, like there's sometimes when you're walking with God and you just know you're in the flow. 
it's like the kumbayas are happening, the goosebumps are always floating, the feelings. Every time you open up your Bible, like for Bible bingo, you're like, bingo, Jesus, I'm there and I'm with you and I love you and you will succeed and you will prosper. Oh, yes, next page. Oh, I am with you and you will succeed. And, you know, like, and then there are times where you open your Bible and you're trying to, you know, you're just scratching or anything. The Bible's empty and they're like... (laughs) You're reading it, it's the most dull, boring, you're a bit worried, it's so dry, it's going to catch fire from the friction. And then you, if you are able to read it, it's like, you do a damn to hell. It's like, like you know, or like, I will, I will burn them to, or they'll cut them to pieces and dash them against a rock. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to cheat. And, and you go through these seasons where nothing is going on, and God, where are you? I was so sure I heard you say, go. And I've gone... And I'm pretty sure you're not here. Anything would be great right now. Some reassurance, like a nice little Bible bingo scripture, a prophet to come and say, you're on the right track, keep going. And, you know, any of the th- any things. And sometimes it's just like you're there and then there's a storm and you think you're going to die. And Jesus was supposed to be behind you, but then I'm pretty sure he's like forgotten about me. And then maybe he's going to like, yeah, you'll get there when you're dead and in heaven. And you're just like, but what we've what we got to appreciate here is that Jesus said go. And now this is what, this, this is a game changer. Revelations chapter 9, Revelation, sorry, I almost got per, like stoned to death by the, the um, people. Revelation, oh, I was going to go down tracks, so I shouldn't have gone down. Spirit of self-control is on this one. Hallelujah. Revelation 19.13, it says that his name is the word of God. That Jesus' name is the word of God. One John, uh, sorry, John chapter 1 verse 1 says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then verse 14 says that he... Uh, it, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. So G, the word, before Jesus ever rocked around planet earth in his Nike Air sandals, his one piece garment, you know, like apparently that's the thing, like the one piece, you know, we think a three piece suit's good. Back then it was the one piece, it was seamless. Before any of that, he actually created time and space as the word before he ever manifests in anything remotely close to human form, he created time and space as the Word of God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It even says that nothing was made without him. It, was, it wasn't until around 6 BC when Jesus was born as a person that, that we knew him as we know him now, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby Jesus from the Middle East. I'm pretty sure that drawing is so wrong. <laughs> it's like, uh, anyway, so what I'm getting at is here is that if the word, if, if God has spoken a word to you and you don't have the feels and you don't have the confirmations and you don't have the goose, if he spoke the word to you, he is the word. He gave the word to those disciples and he said, go. And that word go was the person of Jesus manifest. And what we have to realize is sometimes we're in a boat and God said, go. And now we have nothing else except the fact we remember him saying, go. That is Jesus in the boat with you. He is in the boat. His word is him. And there's this passage here in Jeremiah, the, the Jeremiah chapter 1. It says, that, uh, from the Amplified, I'll read it. The, um, so the Lord said to me, you have seen it. But here's what I want to pull out. It says, for I... I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. Remember how it said here in, in Mark. It says, he went up a mountainside to pray. And it says he saw them. He's watching over his word to fulfill it. He's given you his word. He sent you on mission with his word. And it says he's watching his word to fulfill it. If all you have is a word from God, can I tell you that you have God himself with you? He is never not in your boat. He is never not in your boat. does not matter what is going on around you. doesn't matter how you feel. 
He is with you always. In fact, he himself said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. You cannot, you cannot, you can't be without God. He is always in your boat. Now, the next thing I want us to say, the next lesson, lesson number three, you don't need the boat. In all of our boating stories, we find out that the boat is absolutely nebulous. It's totally, totally, no, it's not totally in, unnecessary, but it can be. It can be. Ma- ma- Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. This is following over from that. Uh, it's it's uh, Matthew's version of the same story we read in Mark. Um, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, "Tell tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. This is really building on point two. He is always with you. If his word is with you, he is with you. And this is taking it a step further. If he speaks, if he's given you his word that you don't need the boat, you don't need the boat. He's told Peter, you don't need the boat. Get out of the boat and come over here. And Peter gets out of the boat. He wasn't very good at it, let's be fair. Like as we read that story on, he starts to sink and panics and everything. He wasn't very good at it. But he did better than you and I ever did. And Jesus said, you don't need the boat. There's this passage in Acts chapter 27, and this is Paul. He's on his trip over to, uh, he's headed to Rome to speak to Caesar. He's, um, after they'd gone a long time without food, so just to catch you up, there's been a giant storm. Uh, the apostle Paul is a prisoner. He's put on a, 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 a prisoner ship. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the technical term for this. <laughs> he's on this ship. And he's going over to, uh, from the Middle East, he's going over to Europe to, uh, to, present, to appeal a decision against him to the high court over there to Caesar. He's been accused of being a Christian and uh, in, in you know, different ways, shapes and form, rebelling against Caesar is really the, what, 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 the technicality they were getting him on. And he was going over to say to Caesar and actually to explain how, you know. So he's on this ship. Massive storms kicked up. It's been going for two weeks solid. They've thrown all this stuff overboard. They've done everything humanly possible to save their ship. And this is where the story we will pick up the story. After they'd gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Uh, you would have spared yourself, yourselves from this damage and loss. So that, he, that was him saying, I told you so. Before the last port they left he said guys big storms coming it's going to cause major drama we shouldn't go and he's Paul he gets up and the way he endears himself to these people is he says I told you so should have listened to me guys I can never even start to understand why Paul got beaten so much why he got flogged so much I wonder if it wasn't so much to do with his ministry more to do with his personality just a just a side observation Told you so, guys. It says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, of the God whom I, uh, to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me he, and said, don't be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. If you have his word, you don't need the boat. These guys are at sea, about to lose their boat. Paul said, I was told go. Because I was told go, even when this boat goes, I'm still going to go. Even when the boat disintegrates, even when the boat is destroyed, I have the word to go. Therefore, I will carry on at sea without a boat. 
And we see that Paul continues through and the, the rest of the story is he, he, he lands on an island and that, um, he's, he does some amazing ministry on the island and he does progress to, his, to Rome. But what I want us to see here is that God will talk to you sometimes with a word and say, go, and then your boat falls apart. Has anyone had their boat fall apart on them mid-journey? What we, as we read that story, what we see is Paul says, some of the guys, if you're a good swimmer, just swim for sure. If you can't swim, grab onto a bit of debris. I've had my bits of debris fall apart. <laughs> like, you're know, like, my ship fell apart, my boat fell apart, then I've got my little life ring, that fell apart, and then you're like, it, it's just like, whatever you had is... And the, and, and, but what God's saying here is, <laughs> Melissa's losing it at the front here. She's watched my bits fall apart from time to time. She, sometimes it's like, you know what? I have no boat. God, how can I get to where you told me with no boat? And what we really need to start to do is actually believe the power of the word. Believe the power of the instruction because with the instruction came the grace. God does not set you up to fail. With his, it says, I watch over my word to perform it. We read that in, the, in Jeremiah. It says, God will perform it. You don't perform. You're not a monkey. You're not a dolphin balancing the ball on you. Is it a seal that balances the ball? Dolphins do other tricks, I'm sure. But you, we don't perform. We don't perform. It says, God, his word will do its duty. And he will watch over it to make sure of it. So what I think, and this is one of the wonderful tensions that we get to live in as faith-filled believers... We start here, and then God says, go there. So we're here. Boat falls apart, but life's actually okay. And I don't mean it in the sense of, like, I love sitting with no boat. In the, it's like, you know what? There's a lot of stuff that God said he has for me. Like, it might be God told you that you're going to get married and have children, and you're over here single. And, like, the only people coming to your door is like door knockers and they're trying to sell you solar power <laughs> and you're like but jesus you said you'll give me a husband i don't want solar panels i want a husband <laughs> or you might you know and you're at this point but then you actually and you can get so caught up with where you're supposed to end up that you miss out on now see paul he was told you're going over here then he's on a boat falling apart. Now, if he had have been so caught up on going, he would not have been able to stay and save all of the people on that boat. All of the people, not one would perish on that boat because he was present. Even though he was going, he was present. The promise was over here. He was, came from there. Things aren't going the way he had hoped, but he has ministry right here, right now. God has stuff for you right here, right now. Even though you're going, even though your boat is falling apart. And Melissa taught us the other day, Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. This is the gentleman, Paul, who knows about being in the ocean with, with a sea, rather, with no boat. He's like, I'm in a boat that's falling apart in a storm and I'm content. This is what God has given me for now. And then he goes on to this little island. And instead of being grisly, oh, we're on some stupid island. We're supposed to be over in Rome. He's like, no. And then he's in the island. And the island, he starts to minister to the, to the locals. God does amazing things because he's there and he's present. And he goes on. And you, you see Paul's journey to Caesar. He's in prison, locked up. But he's present and celebrating and content that he's in that season. He's got no boat. He's chained to walls. He's supposed to be flowing onto his great destiny of preaching to Caesar. And he's in jail. And because he's content, he writes half of the New Testament. His writing still echoes through time 2,000 years later. God used him amazingly in his generation and every single generation to follow. Because he was present. Because he wasn't caught up with the go so much that he couldn't do now. So I think what we need to do is that when the boat falls apart, it doesn't matter. We have the word. So we might be in a season where it's, we're stuck. 
We're going a lot slower than we'd hoped. God, where is the great ministry you promised me? God, where is the family you promised me? Where is this prosperity, this abundance you promised me? Where is this healing and this health that you promised me? God said, I, I never changed my mind. I never changed the word. I already let go of that word. It's gone. It's going to happen. It will not return void. That word is as good as done. But now, today, you've got to be present. Do today well. In all things, give thanks. In all things, do your season well. And I just think that some of us, one of the lessons from the boat has to be get over not having a boat. You don't need the boat. If you've got the word, you don't need the boat. Amen? Amen. I'm going to wrap up. I've been under strict instructions. Jake, if you haven't preached for four weeks, don't go mental. Oh, no, no. Trust me. We, when the Holy Spirit stops, it's a good time for me to stop. We, we don't need to go further than him. I'm going to pray. Lord, this is bow our heads, guys. Lord, I thank you that you are God of the boat and you're God of the storm. Lord, I thank you that you are always with us. No matter what is going on, you are there. Whether we see or feel you, we, you are there. And Lord, even when, we, when the boat falls apart on us, Lord God, the vehicle or the vessel we had hoped would carry us from A to B, Lord God, even when it's gone, we trust that your word by itself is enough. So Lord, I just want to speak to hearts that have received a word from God. This is what I really think God's doing this morning. Hearts that have received a word from him that said, go. Hearts that said, I have this for you. A promise from God where God said, yes. And you said, amen to that. Because the scripture says all of the promises of God, he says yes to. If we will say, okay, I agree, so be it. This says, then we have it. For a lot of us here have heard from God at one point and we believed God and we set off excited, we set off in faith. And we've hit some bumps in the road. We've been through some storms. Some of us, that boat is gone. Some of us, it feels like Jesus is nowhere near our boat. We're wondering if we're on track still. For some of us, we're having a hard time letting go of the boat. Letting God have the good and the bad. The assets and the liabilities. Lord, wherever we are on this journey, and most of us will probably be at all points in different areas. Wherever we are, Lord, we just meet, we just we know you're there, God. And we say we trust you to take care of our good things. Not just to take care of the problems, but to take care of our good things. Lord, for those of us that are just at a despairing point where, the, where it feels like we're in a storm and you're not there, Lord, we know you're with us. By faith, we agree that you're with us still, that if you sent your word, you are, your word is you. You are the word. And if your word is with us, that means you are here and in, here in power. For those of us that are in a storm so brutal, the boat is breaking up. Maybe the boat is gone. Maybe bankruptcy happened. Maybe divorce happened. Maybe the particular medical situation has gone too far. We say, God, I believe your word regardless. I stand on your word regardless of these circumstances. And I declare that I will see it come to pass. And it's your responsibility to perform the word, not ours. Because you sent the word, which means you watch over it to achieve it. Holy Spirit. For those people, God, I just want to encourage you and just infuse you with strength. Say, God said yes to it. Keep your amen strong. You don't need to know how. This is the word that God gave me as I was preparing this. Sometimes... You plan your journey, and that journey requires a boat. And I just have to tell you, God doesn't need your boat. (laughs) 
Sometimes the healing doesn't need medication. Sometimes the child doesn't need birth. Mary said, how can I have a child if I've not known a, na- um, not known a man? God has the liberty of doing things his way. We can get so precious about our boat. Sometimes Jesus will ask for your boat and then give you a fish and you want to give him all these boats, but sometimes he'll take it and break it up and let you swim to an island. Both are okay. Both are his way. We have to be okay either way. We surrender our insistence on it being done our way, God. I really believe that there are people here who have just, it's such a clear call and you're looking at it and you're like, where, how on earth am I going to get there now? God says, I don't need a boat, mate. Would you trust me? Do you still trust me? Do you still believe the word I sent? I don't need a boat. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank you for grace. I thank you for fresh fire. Fresh fire, mighty God. Refreshing, Lord God. Just the wind of, just the roar of God. Just your breath, Lord. Lord, we repent where we've insisted you do it our way. We're encouraged, Lord, knowing you have never left us, you've never forsaken us, never let us down. I'm just, God just really clearly just told me right then, to you people who there was a plan and your plan seems to be shipwrecked, God has said, I never, ch- I never changed the plan. He said, he said, I never changed the plan. The word still is. You know, there's a passage that says that the plans of God are irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God, the call on your life, the gifts he has given you are irrevocable. One translation says without repentance, meaning God will never change his mind on that. His plan for your life still stands. It might not look the way you thought it was going to look. Not get there the way you thought you'd get there. It's God's business, above your pay grade, above my pay grade. Holy Spirit, just thank you for a reinvigoration, Lord God. Fresh fire, fresh fire. So while we're in this attitude of prayer, I just want to, if anybody here who's, you know, you couldn't tell me you've started your journey with God. You wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Christ. You know, if that's you, we're just going to say a prayer. If it's you, might be online or you might be joining us in here. We're going to pray, pray all together. Just to align ourselves with Christ and put ourselves in that position where God, where we ask him for forgiveness and we make a declaration we're going to follow him. So just ask everybody to repeat after me. And if you're praying this for the first time, can I just ask you, pray it out loud and mean it with all of your heart. I repeat after me, church. Dear God, today I choose to follow you. Forgive me for living life my own way. Wash me clean. Give me grace to walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just where every head's still bowed and every eye's closed. If, you're, if you prayed that for the first time or maybe you'd walked away from God and you're coming back, can you do me a favor and just put your hand in the air just so I can see it? I would love to pray with you. If you're online, that you could uh, let us know in the comments or uh, private message us and we'd love to get in touch with you and get some resources to you, help you on that journey. But just one moment longer, if that's you, I just invite you to slip your hand in the air just so I can see nobody's looking around. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God's good, hey? God's good.
Oh, Lord, you're so good. We're just going to worship, church. I just invite you to just stand to your feet.